you are welcome to today's update just a few days before Christmas. Let's start off with some good news. The Oxford vaccine is going to be approved on the 28th or the 29th of December in the United Kingdom and that's going to have a major impact in the UK, Europe and actually quite a lot in the United States who've booked quite a lot of doses. So that's some good news but otherwise it, things aren't very good at the moment to be quite honest. Cases are increasing dramatically in the United Kingdom, in some areas of Europe, despite lockdown measures, and also in the United States. And I want to talk a little bit more about this new vari variant of the virus, this mutation of the virus that's come along. There's quite a lot of misunderstanding about this at the moment, so I just want to clarify some things about that. I was actually watching a, a, a committee today where some MPs were interviewing some scientists and it was just fairly obvious from the nature of the questions that some of these MPs were asking that they really didn't understand too much about it at all. So I want to clarify some of that, but let's do so in the context of what's happening. Now, um, let's look at the UK first of all. And I'm afraid we are seeing um, th this significant increase in cases in the United Kingdom here. So um, these are cases by date reported and there's no question we have a sharp, a sharp increase in new cases. So there's no question the cases are increasing. Now how is this feeding through into healthcare provision and hospitalizations of course is a very important, uh, very important factor. Now we see that over 2,000 people were admitted to hospitals uh, in the 24-hour period and that means over 20,000 people are now hospitalised in the United Kingdom and this, this is remarkably significant because this puts us back up to where we were at the peak of the first wave. Now I was on record of say, as saying I didn't think the uh, hospitalisations would reach the, the, the peak of the first wave and I was kind of right and kind of wrong. They, they didn't for a while, it dipped down um, but, but now um, that they are increasing to those levels and hospitals are under strain. There's no, there's no two ways about it now. So um, the hospitalisation figures, uh, well, here we see these are patients admitted. So how many patients were actually admitted on the day? So we see 2039 there. This is the cumulative number of patients in hospital. And, th and this is really quite a concerning figure. So we know that the latest cases are even higher than, than is on this graphic now from the top. Um, we know that the actual figure there for the 24 hour period is just over 2,000. Um, so we are basically where we were pretty well. I mean, okay, it's 21,000 there, but we're pretty well where we were in April. So not good. Now, slightly, well, I say slightly better news, it's going up again, but this is the number of people in uh, intensive care. So we see it's not quite as high uh, as it, as it, um, that was, that was the peak in, in April. This is the, the figures now. So not quite as high. So less people severely ill. Although I do know where, where I am uh, locally, the local hospital, the intensive care is actually full at the moment. So certain parts of the country under a lot of pressure. Now, death wise, um, the news is probably slightly better. Um, I mean, a lot of people are quite a lot of people are dying, but the numbers aren't going up as dramatically. So these are deaths within 28 days of a positive test by date of death. And uh, we see the flattish and indeed going probably projected to go down a little there. But when we look at it within uh, 28 days of the uh, the day the test was uh, reported, uh, we do see that they're probably going up slightly. We always get this delay with the uh, with death things because it takes time. People get infected, and then they die, and it takes time for the death to be reported. There's always a delay in death reporting, so that the figures in cases are always well ahead of the figures in in deaths in terms of collecting the figures and as well as in the natural d delay that, that we see. And I, I think while we're there, we'll just look at the figures in the United States as well to give us to give us the, the background uh, on, on a more international scale. So this is the Centers for Disease Control. And again, these are completely live feeds, um, trends for the Centers for Disease Control. 
and uh, we, we see that's actually the number of deaths. Let's start with the number of cases. So here we have the number of cases and we see what is a dramatic increase in the states. Um, so 215,000 new cases per day as a seven day rolling average. And that's even a little out of date. So, and then we will look at the deaths which are increasing more in the United States than they are in the UK. So um, quite large increases in deaths in the States. We can see the figures there. It's uh, we're gonna get some figures there. Seven day moving average, 2,654 deaths per day on average for the seven days leading up to the 20th of uh, December. So that's the context we're in. Um, and of course, we're only in December and uh, people are traveling around for Christmas and New Year. And I'm not gonna pretend I'm not concerned for January, I, I really am. Um, cases look like they're going to carry on increasing in January potentially into February because the vaccines aren't going to give us herd immunity for some time. And there's also implications on herd immunity from this potential new variant as well. So we, we had hoped that herd immunity would be reached at around about 70% when about 70% of people have been infected. But if, if this new variant is that much more infectious and it's looking like it is, the consensus of scientific opinion in the UK is that this is about 70% more contagious than the previous variants. Then what that means is because it's so much more contagious, we need more people to be immune to reach this herd immunity, this community protection level. And that now with this new variant could be as high as 80%. So it could mean that the pandemic will go on for longer because it's going to take vaccination, the vaccination programme, that much longer to reach herd immunity figures if we are dealing with more transmissibility as, as strongly does seem to be uh, the case at the moment. So UK Office for National Statistics 6 to the 12th of December um, always out of date for the official figures of course but uh, it, it, even here we see an increase but we've seen a, a big increase since then we've been increasing quite dramatically over the past few weeks as we've just seen so uh, well over half a million people infected in the week from the 6th to the 12th of um, December. That represents one in 95 people. Uh, London, East of England, uh, East Midlands, South East have increased in that time period. North West Yorkshire and the Humber have decreased during that time period. So mixed pattern in different parts of the country, as indeed is the case in the States, very mixed in different parts of the country but the overall trend nationally is upwards. And indeed the North West Yorkshire and the Humber have, um, that they're no longer going down the number of cases there either because this data is always a little out of date. Um, Scotland, um, so, so that, that, that gives one in, 100, one in 95 people infected in England during that week. Scotland, it was one in 100. Wales, it was one in 90. Um, COVID-19 deaths decreased for the second week in a row because of this long lag effect. Um, and uh, de deaths, uh, there were another 2,756 uh, deaths in the week. Um, but that's the data up to the, uh, that, that the death date is actually up to the 11th of December. So um, always the lag in the, in the death data. Um, and even though it was good during that time period, well, good, there was a relative reduction during that time period. Even in that time period, up to the, uh, up to the 11th of December, deaths remained above the five-year average in all regions in England and Wales. So um, the trend was bad even then, it's worse now. Sharp increases in the last few weeks in the UK. And I know the government are thinking seriously about further locking down measures as the health services are coming under strain. Some of the things that we've feared since the start of this pandemic are coming around. We'll look at some examples from the States. But you'll know if you've been watching this, this video that the main risk is that we know the infection fatality rate in COVID-19 is low, providing people can get some basic medical care. 
might just need oxygen for a few days, might just need some antibiotics for secondary bacterial infection, might just need some steroids for a few days to damp down the inflammation in the alveoli of the lungs. So a lot of people can, can uh, have a significantly improved prognosis with even just basic medical care. The, the, the number that we see that need actual intensive care, as we've seen, is, is relatively smaller. But if a lot of people all come at once, even that can be a challenge. And that means that people can die unnecessarily. And uh, that is the trajectory that we are on in the United Kingdom and indeed parts of the United States at the moment. This is the concern. Right. Um, th these are the sites for the data. I always put them on, of course. You can just click on them yourselves. Now, US hospitalizations, again, under strain, going up all the time, up to 117 thousand in fact that data was the 21st of december so that's a little out of date now so we're looking at 120,000 patients in hospital at the moment in the united states this is this is a large number of patients with covid19 at the moment and remember these are as well as all the other patients as well of course it's not instead of ordinary diseases have not gone away deaths 18,000 in the last seven days week before it was 17,000, week before that it was 15,000. So the trajectory of deaths in the United States, and that's pretty up-to-date data, that's from the COVID Symptom Tracking Project, which is that reference there. Do click on that for yourselves. Very thorough data there. Um, so deaths increasing week on week in the United States. California, um, if, if you look on the uh, the American site, you'll see the... Uh, the US states and trends, do we have it? Uh, there we are. Here's the, uh, the more geographical data from the states. Um, it seems to be quite straight today for some reason. There we are. Um, so uh, total deaths in the states, total cases, diagnosed cases, nearly 18 million. That's diagnosed cases, of course, the real number of cases are way higher. We don't know exactly how high, but probably, well, uh, well, w w w no point guessing. O o over over seven and seven times that, we believe. So, so much higher than that. Uh, but there's the geographical picture for the states. Uh, click on it. Yes, a couple of days ago, we looked at Tennessee, which was high, California, which was high. And we can see the uh, you know, Tennessee still leading, unfortunately, in terms of um, cases per 100,000 in the past seven days um very high in fact oklahoma california you can look at your own state there with a simple click of the mouse it's you know you know um if you're as old as me it's still completely amazing that there's so much data there so readily available it's just just incredible anyway um back to the topic in hand la county the prevalence is now one in uh, 80 in Los Angeles, Los Angeles County. And we know that um, the hospitals there are under massive uh, strain. Now, I have a letter here from a nurse in uh, in, in Fresno County. Um, I'm not going to give you a name. I know her in California. Um, she hasn't given me permission yet. I'm hoping to get it, but I haven't got it yet. So I'm not going to give you a name. But uh, I know this is an accurate uh, email from her. And this is what she says. We have had 9,572 new COVID cases last week. Over seven days, an all-time high for us in, uh, in, in Fresno County. ICU beds in the county are full. A new 50-bed ICU ward was opened today and there are plans to open overflow beds for COVID-19 patients in the convention centre. So like overflow hospital facilities, like, like the Nightingale facilities in the UK. But of course, the problem, it's not too hard to open new facilities. It's staffing them that's the problem. We've been short staffed by work, uh, work related to staff members testing positive for COVID-19, who of course have got to self-isolate so that the staff shortage is exacerbated by staff self-isolating. I find it very frustrating that people I know say this, say this is not a real pandemic because of the only 1% of patients die. Now, we hope it's it's the, the overall infection fatality rate is much less than that, but um, a patient's going into hospital, um, it's much higher, of course. 
Some people are getting sick and the rest of us need to protect them by wearing masks, social distancing and avoiding group situations. So uh, Fresno County, California, just as an example, ITU's full staff under severe pressure. Now, moving on to the new variant uh, situation that's caused quite a bit of confusion. Now, I'm going to start off with some information from the United States on this. Uh, this is uh, Jeremy Lumban of Virologist University of Massachusetts Medical School. Talking about this new uh, variant that was first discovered in the UK, it may well be here already, Jeremy says. In fact, it, it, he said it may, it, it may have start, it even started here. That's quite possible. Um, so this was first identified in Kent, but we'll look at reasons why it did not necessarily arise in Kent. It may have done, but um, it's, we don't know. We don't know where it arose, basically. We don't really know where it was first detected. The problem is the sequencing in the US is so sporadic. So it's the genetic sequencing that revealed that this uh, mutation was, was there. And that's done more thoroughly in the United Kingdom than it is in the United States. It's a bit hit and miss in the United States. Uh, it makes sense that it was detected first in the UK because they are probably the world's best surveillance programme. And in fact, um, this is true. Um, no nationalistic jingoism here at all. It's simply the facts. The thing is, in the United Kingdom, we'd set up this big group for genomic analysis because we're doing this 100,000 patient study to examine the full genomes of 100,000 people. So uh, back in back in April, I think it was, uh, they shifted to look at looking at more infectious diseases. So they had this great genetic analytical capacity already there. And they adapted that to analysing uh, genomes. So actually, if you take all of the genomes of this virus that are analysed in, in the whole world, 40, 45% of them are actually analysed in the, in the UK. Um, another virologist um, from uh, Georgetown Centre for Global Health Science and Security. Um, so it would not shock me at all to find uh, out that it is also circulating in the United States. Uh, the coronavirus is already in the United States and is spreading easily. A new variant will not change the need for public to follow public health guidelines. In fact, uh, we could argue it even more so if it's, if it's more contagious. Um, so basically what these epidemiologists fear is that this virus is already circulating in the United States and that's possible. Um, so they don't think a travel ban is going to be particularly helpful, although all traveling is, is an issue. I mean, I think what she, what, what she means here is not particularly going to help for this particular variant, but all traveling is, is spreading the virus, of course. Uh, we already have out of control transmission of all the vi variants that are currently circulating in the United States out of control transmission. The situation in the United States is escalating. It is out of control. Uh, November, uh, for example, there was 30,000 direct flights of passengers to the United States from London Heathrow Airport. So, and of course, this new variant goes back to September. So that's kind of the context of, of where we are. Um, it's not good. It's not good. Things are, are rapidly escalating and I don't know what's going to happen. Well, I, I think what's going to happen is some people are going to die because they can't get hospital treatments in January, February. E even in our sophisticated Western countries, I fear that's going to happen. This is, this is what we're worried about. Um, anyway, let's, let's go on to what we do know. Now, uh, th this is the mutation stroke new variant. And we know that the N amino acid in the, 50, in the 501st position of the protein and the spike protein uh, has been changed from the N form of the amino acid to the Y form of the amino acid. This appears to have made it more transmissible. Now, um, the, in, in the United States, they seem to be calling this new mutation B117. In the UK, as far as I know, uh, from the British Medical Journal a few days ago, we're still calling it 2020-12, but... There you go, two, you can pick whatever name you want at the moment, I guess it will become clear. Um, well, let's think a few things about this. Um, significance of the 2012. So, so when I'm saying the 2012 here, 
In the United States, that translates to B117. It's exactly the same. These are the same, one and the same. Significance of the 2012 was not uh, clear until the 8th of December by analysing epidemiological data from Kent. So this is where it was first picked up. Uh, there was a delay, though. Sequencing takes three weeks and hundreds are needed to, for correlation studies. So at first they just found another mutation. Actually, this was back on the 21st of September this was first found. But uh, there's been 12,000 mutations identified. So it was only re seen as significant when this mutation, this new variant or this new lineage of the virus, was more prevalent in areas where cases were increasing most rapidly. That's what first got first people thinking about it. And it turns out that um, the part of the virus, this 501 part of the, uh, the 501st amino acid in the spike domain protein that binds into the cells, that's right in the receptor binding domain. It's the most important part for the virus clicking into a cell to infect the cell. And it's interesting in South Africa, uh, the, there's, a, there's a 501, an, an N501Y mutation as well. It's the same mutation where the N amino acid has changed to the Y amino acid, but it's arisen separately. So it just shows there's a potential selection pressure for that. Because if it arises and it's able to infect cells more readily, that is the type of the virus that will reproduce. So that type of the virus will out-reproduce the other types of virus. It's a bit like grey squirrels and red squirrels in this country. The, the, the grey squirrels uh, out-compete the, the red squirrels and, and you get a, a population shift. So over time, the pandemic, all, all, of, all of the new cases in, in the UK or nearly all of the new cases in the UK will be the N501Y uh, 2012 mutation. It will become the most, it is rapidly now becoming the most prevalent format and that will continue that is simple uh, evolution darwinian evolution um, now it's more infectious as well now people are saying there's an increased viral load with this new mutation i'm going to put a question mark on that because i'm not sure that's true i have heard some scientists saying that and the reason i'm not sure it's true if there's a high viral load i expect people to, people to be sicker and as far as we know at the moment they're not sicker but perhaps what is happening is that this new variant of the virus tends to infect the nose and the mouth and the oropharynx, the upper airway. So more viruses shed. So people that are infected shed larger numbers of virus. And if they're shedding larger numbers of virus, it's going to be more transmissible, of course. And of course, if people are infected with larger number of, numbers of virus, that might make them sicker. So even though this virus is not intrinsically more pathogenic, the fact that people are being infected with higher numbers of the virus because an infected person is shedding larger numbers of the virus may potentially increase the, uh, the, the how sick the, the, the new person that gets infected becomes. Um, so quick, quick, with a lot of things we don't know yet, but it looks like there's more viral shedding and from lab studies from Port and Down. Only we only, we only knew, know this because it's released by uh, Sage, who get their information from Port and Down Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, that it does affect this particular receptor binding domain. It's not from the scientific journal yet, but we've no reason to assume that the Sage Committee are, are uh, trying to mislead us in any way. Now, the country with the best genomics monitoring has the most mutations. Now, the UK has got most of the forty-five percent of global um, genomic monitoring. Now, is it, is, it, is, is it just coincidence that the country with the best monitoring in the world found this mutation first? Could be, but it's unlikely. It looks like this mutation could be in other places. We've just happened to pick it up because we've got more sequencing. So um, it could well be that it's many other places already. In fact, we know it's all over the UK already. I would be amazed if this is not picked up in the coming days in all European countries. And I would expect that the Robert Koch Institute in Germany and the Centers for Disease Control in the United States and the Pasteur Institute in France are all frantically analyzing the viral genome now to see if it is there already. And I suspect now they're looking, now they look, know what to look for, it will be found because it clearly has a selection advantage for this particular mutation. 
Now Denmark has got the highest, Denmark much lower population than the UK, but Denmark's got the highest per capita sequence and hey ho, they found some cases as well. Only 10 so far. But again, you know, is it just coincidence that the country with the highest per capita uh, level of genomic sequences finds the, uh, the new variant? Well, no, no, it's not. This is almost certainly spread to many other countries and probably the United States included. Australia, again, with very good genome. Now, Australia, they've only got 28 cases. No, no, they're up to about 60 cases at the moment in Australia. But they've picked up two cases of this new 2020-12 uh, variant, mutation, whatever you want to call it. And again, it's because they've got good monitoring that they picked it up. Um, other countries have just failed to pick it up, I believe. We will know soon. Uh, there have been contemporaneous increases in the incidence in several countries. So what we noticed, if we take Wales, for example, in my country, uh, or, or London, I mean, both much the same, that the increase in cases was noted. And it turns out that the part of the reason that there's an increase in cases is because of this new mutant, a uh, new strain that's been ident now identified. But there's been, there's been uh, contemporaneous increases in quite a few countries. But because they're not screening, we don't know, we don't know if that's caused by the new mutation or not. I suspect some of it will turn out to be by the new mutation. Um, mutations occur at an equal rate in every part of the equal rate at every part in the world. So there's no reason why things should be any worse in the UK than any anywhere else is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and this is not because I live in the UK. This is just trying to point out. I mean, I mean let's let's look at another example. So, South Africa mutation has a similar effect of 2012, but arose separately. So again, it's the 501. It's the 501 mutation, and it's the it's actually the same change. It's the N amino acid is changed to the Y amino acid. But this rose arose independently. So what it means is when this mutation arises, because it's more transmissible, it is selected for and outcompetes the other strains of the virus. So that's in South Africa. We know it's in South Africa. Completely different origin, different mutation, but selected for by the same selection pressure. I mean, we mentioned the, the, the other day that bats have got wings and birds have got wings, and, but even though they the, the arose completely separately, because one's a mammal and one's a bird, but they kind of do the same job. So they're both selected for. That is simple Darwinian natural selection. And exactly the same works with viruses. So um, South Africa, we know that this new mutation is around. Different one, but affecting the same amino acid. Now, Nigeria has got a surge in cases. We think, we think. But it's hard to tell because the, the testing in Nigeria is abysmal. And in a country of 206 million people, as far as I know, they have no domestic ability to do genomic analysis. None. Quite incredible. Um, but they've had a sharp increase in cases despite very poor level of testing. And as far as I know, no genomic sequencing. So is this surge in cases that we are seeing in Nigeria albeit hard to tell because of the poor testing, is that caused by spread of this N501Y mutation from uh, South Africa? Well, quite possibly, quite possibly. Now, another thing that's being talked about here is um, it's possible children may be more susceptible to the new, to the new uh, variant. We don't know that yet. This is a very simple correlation at the moment. There's been an increase in the number of cases in children that have correlated with the increase in the incidence of uh, the, 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 the rise of the new variant 2020-12. So there's a correlation there. Whether, it's, whether the increase in cases in children have been caused by the increased prevalence of 2020-12, we don't know. Uh, but they, they are correlated. The two are going together. So it may be particularly important to avoid spread in children. We don't know at the moment it's an association. But these things do start as associations. I mean, I mean the, the, the reason that we found the, this 2020-12 uh, uh, variant uh, or, or realised the significance of it was because we looked at the correlation studies between the increasing, increasing cases in London with the increasing prevalence of the new variant and then went on to, uh, to, to find out that it is in fact or, or we're virtually certain now it is in fact causal. 
So correlations often guide you as to where to look. So people are looking at children at the moment. Any anyone infected person can infect uh, be infected with a right, vi wide range of viral genomes. So anyone that's got COVID-19, it's not just that they have one pure strain of the virus. They'll actually have probably you know viruses with with uh, many mutations in. Uh, I don't know, ten, twenty different viral strains that are quite possible because the virus mutates so frequently. You know, a typical viral strain is mutating a couple of times a month. So actually there's thousands of different, slightly different genetic strains of the virus undergoing community transmission in the UK and the United States at the moment. So that's interesting that it's different types of the virus, um, but all adding up to one, to one infection. Um, now, likelihood of long COVID. Um, so we know that a certain number of people get this long COVID, they're ill for longer. And as far as we know, we don't think that this is more likely with any particular genetic variation of the virus. So we don't think that it's a particular lineage of the virus that causes, um, that causes long COVID. It seems to be more host factors in the individual. And we have looked at those before. So it doesn't look like this virus is causing more severe disease unless it increases viral load. That would be my concern. It doesn't look like it's causing more cases of long COVID. That's more host factors. But of course, if more people get infected, then a percentage of those get long COVID, then that's going to increase. And uh, it doesn't look like uh, the, the new variant is affecting uh, vaccine efficacy at the moment either. Uh, biology of linkage between genetic change and viral behaviour change is poorly understood. So we're not quite sure what these genetic changes mean. Um, so far, all the viruses seem to behave much the same, really. The different variants seem to behave much the same. They don't, <clears throat> it's not one strain of virus seems to cause more severe disease. <clears throat> now, the R number in the UK has gone up from 0 0.8 to 1.2. Or that is the no no. Let me rephrase that. That is the effect of the virus. It increases. It, it means the R value goes up. It's more transmissible. And in the UK today, the R value is between one point one and one point three. Let me put it another way: we have exponential growth in the UK, and this is a big problem, as indeed you have in the United States. Um, so the R value without any controls was probably three. So the reason it's as low as this is because of the controls that we do have. And this variant is more likely to arise in immunological patients, but I'm not going to study that today. OK, I was going to do a bit about that. We'll leave, we'll leave the bit, that biology bit for tomorrow, I think. Um, gone on a bit long today. Let's just notice that uh, Taiwan, uh, some saddish news from Taiwan. Uh, population 23 million. The people there are not very happy uh, because um, they're going to roll back on foreign flights, tighten quarantine requirements for crew because a cargo pilot from New Zealand seems to have caused a cluster. After 253 days, I can see why the people are absolutely livid that this could be interfering with their New Year celebrations. Now, in Taiwan, they will get on top of this, but it may greatly curtail the time of year they've been looking forward to, as indeed we all have. Um, but in Taiwan, they had 253 days without any infection. So it looks like it was a cargo pilot. And that's the first local transmission for 253 days. But I'm sure they will get on top of this cluster. So um, we'll, we'll do that bit on, um, on the, the RNA of the virus next time. I don't want to go on forever because everyone will be switching off. There's probably only three people still watching now, in fact. But if, if you are still watching, thank you for, for staying with it. Um, just uh, some other poorish news. We have been looking at the situation in uh, Chipping Norton, where church services had to be booked. Uh, I had to be booked. The times had to be booked and uh, the, the services were staged. Now, uh, as you can see, they're no longer going ahead at all. 
And although this is unfortunate, I commend it because it's only for a short period of time. So the next few months continues to be a concern. Yeah, no two ways about it. It's, it's a concern for the next few months. OK, thank you if you've stayed to the end of this rather long video. Um, hope it's helped understanding in some ways.